pagan. Oh, that's a pagan suit. Oh, dear. That's definitely pagan music. Like we, we say, but what does, what does the word pagan mean? The word pagan in English comes from the Latin word paganus, which actually literally means of the village or rustic. Apparently, even back in the time of Rome, the people in the city thought they were better than the people in the country. So they had this term to describe the superstitious, uneducated, kind of crazy way those village country folk thought. And they said, oh, that's just, that's just paganus. That's pagan. And so when the Christian church was growing, and at that time they were using Latin as the, as the, as the language that they, they used, they took this term and, and, and they used it to mean those individuals who did not subscribe to the teachings of scripture, to the, to the main revealed religion, but were still stuck in their superstitious, worshipping the sun and the stars and the trees, those kinds of people. Stay with me, I'm going somewhere. The Oxford Dictionary defines it as this. Pagan is a person holding religious beliefs other than those of the main world religions. Okay, that's, that's just, that's the dictionary definition, okay? Someone who does not follow the basic tenets of Christianity, Judaism, Islam, something like that. As an adjective, when we say something is pagan, what, we are, what it actually means by definition is anything relating to pagans or their belief. So anything that has been made by pagans, that is used by pagans, anything that is related to their belief, by according to the, the dictionary definition, that's what, it's not, that sort of thing would be described as pagan. So... Here's a question, okay? Just yes or no, okay? Should Christians stay away from everything pagan? Who would say yes? So you, you guys know me already too much. You know this is a trick question. Right. But be, be honest. Like, if, if someone just asked you, your gut reaction is probably, if it's pagan, oh. right? Okay. Which of these are of pagan origins. The days of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, are, are those pagan? Okay. Neckties, ties that you wear around your neck, are these, are these pagan? What about the months, names of the months, months of the year? January, February, March, are these pagan? What about decorating during the winter solstice with evergreen plants, is that pagan? It sure is. And how about toilets that flush? Are these, are these pagan? If you said yes to any of the questions, you are correct. Because the answer is yes for all of them. All of these things, and we could list a hundred more, are of a pagan origin. I.e. they were invented by people who did not follow the main religious teachings of the Bible. So in this sense, they're all pagan. Can I just for a moment help someone? You do realize that the tie is a very powerful pagan symbol. And I, because it's Sabbath and it's Sabbath morning, will not explain what it is, but I will encourage you if you're interested to Google it, and I will give you a hint. It speaks of the male person. Can I help you? Jesus did not wear a tie. You do, you do, you do know this. You do. I mean, I'm wearing a tie today. Praise the Lord. I love ties. Listen, friends, I have nothing against ties. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying ties are pagan, as are toilets. What's my point? Is it really realistic to say as a Christian we can avoid everything that has had any connection with paganism? No. That's, that's not possible. So, where did paganism come from? Did God create a pagan world? When the world was created, was it pagan? Okay, that's an easy question. I know some of them are trick questions. Friends, in case you are not sure, God did not create a pagan world, right? Um, how do we know? Okay. Um, let's turn to Genesis chapter 1 verse 31. Genesis 1 verse 31 is on the screen. It says, Then God saw everything he had made, and indeed it was what? It was very good. 
So nothing that God made was out of order or out of step with his original plan, with his original tension, intention. So then where did paganism come from? Paganism came as a result of sin. Genesis chapter 3, some of you are wondering, this does not sound like a Christmas sermon. Please stay with me, I promise we're going somewhere good. Genesis chapter 3 verses 1 to 6 says this, now the serpent, the who? The serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is where? In the midst of the garden, God has said, who said? So she's now saying that she's quoting God. God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you what? Touch it lest you die. Quick question for my Bible students. Did God say that? Yes and no. He said don't eat it, but did he say don't touch it? He didn't say don't touch it. We get ourselves in trouble when in trying to stay away from temptation, we add to God's word things he hasn't said. If we had time, I could unpack that. She got herself in trouble by trying to be more strict than God was. Why? Because if she touches it and it's okay, guess what? She'll eat it. But God never said anything about touching it. So it's like, really? You can't touch it? I'm all in the tree. And now her whole thing starts to unravel. Here's what the snake says, verse 4. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, verse 5, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, what? Your eyes will be open, and what? You will be like God knowing good and evil. Friends, don't miss this. This is, this is, the, this is the, the lie behind everything pagan. The snake is basically saying that if you eat this fruit, some supernatural, spiritual thing will happen to you. Did you catch that? Let me walk it by you again. The snake is saying to Eve, if you eat the fruit, you will gain some spiritual, supernatural blessing. Question. Was there anything poisonous physically about the fruit? Nothing wrong with the fruit. What was the issue with eating the fruit for Eve? Why was it sinful? Because God said not to do it. You remember a couple of weeks we talked about this? Is there anything supernaturally special about Saturday? What's the big deal about it then? God said to worship on it. If, if God says to do something, then do it. If he says don't do it, so God has said, don't eat the fruit. The devil said, no, 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 no. You don't understand. If you take this fruit the right way, something supernatural will happen. So the devil was trying to get Eve to believe that there is supernatural power in parts of the natural world. That if you fully and rightly understand how to use nature, you can get God-like powers. This is what all paganism is. This is why pagans worship the sun and the stars and they have affinity to trees and certain plants because they believe that if you just have the knowledge, you can take the natural world and turn it supernatural. Does that make sense? Does it make sense? Thanks for your honesty. If it doesn't make sense, that's fine. Romans chapter 1 verse 20 to 23. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, For since the creation of the world... His, that's God's, invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Basically, Paul is saying, God, there is evidence for God in nature. 21. Because although they knew God, 
Paul is writing about, about the pagans of his time. He says, although they knew God, although they could see in nature the evidence that clearly God existed, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. People started to worship the creation rather than the creator. This is Basically, all that paganism is, any time I put, help us, Lord, on this, any time I put more faith in something created rather than in the creator, I am exercising and I am operating in a pagan mode of thinking. When I trust my own ability to reason more than a clear, thus saith the Lord, I am being as pagan as the person who falls down in front of a tree. When I think that there is more hope, that's going to get quiet for a moment, in my credit score than in the God that says, prove me now if I will not open the windows of heaven. When I have more faith in my credit score than in the blessing that comes from faithfully returning a tithe to God, I'm operating like a pagan. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. But let's, let's be honest. When we say things are pagan, and maybe you've heard it, maybe it's been whispered in the corridors. Man, this Christmas thing is pagan. When we say that, what we really mean is not just that somehow it was connected to people who don't believe, but that it was specifically created to honor or worship a pagan god. Right? That's what we really mean. When we say, when we say that, what we're saying is this, this is not like the toilet where, okay, the inventor wasn't really, th this is like directly coming from a place where this was made to worship someone who was not Jesus. What should Christians do about that? Should Christians, here's a question, should Christians only engage in things that can be found in the Bible? Can I ask the question another way? Should Christians, oh, I want to get someone in trouble. Should Christians be 100% biblical? Yes or no? It's a tough question, right? And again, you, you know me long enough to know that I'm, I'm trying to make you think. Let me ask you a question. How many of you drove here this morning in a car? Are cars biblical? Let me help you. Can you find an explicit verse in the Bible about driving a car? Does the Bible say, And thou shalt in the last days, O Daniel, drive the car, for with it thou shalt spread the God? Does, does it say that? Okay, no. So cars are not biblical. But, but clearly, driving a car is not against the Bible, right? Like, I don't want anyone to go out there and like, sell their car now. It's not biblical, babe. You're going to walk. No, I'm not, that's, that's not what I'm trying to say. I'm just trying to say, if you're, going, if you're going to be very rigid and black and white with this, there are many things that we do in everyday life. For example, live stream on YouTube. Is that in the Bible? There are many things that we do that are not biblical. But some of you are like, yes, I know. But, but really, that's not the question. I mean, yes, there are some things that are not biblical, but they aren't specifically dedicated to a pagan god. So here's the next question. Should Christians stay away from things specifically dedicated to a pagan god? How many would say yes on that? All right. And I feel you. <clears throat> so then... <laughs> <clears throat> as Shakespeare would say, and there's the rub. If that's what we believe, and many of us do, and understandably so, then what about Christmas trees and other such things? By the way, you do know. It's going to get worse before it gets better. Just strap in. Strap in. You have the tree at home. Just strap in. Trust me. It's going to be good. You do know that Christmas did not originate in the Bible. You do know this. If you, I feel like I've ruined Christmas for someone now. 
What? No, no, the birth of Jesus is in the Bible. That, that, that for sure is. But Christmas, that came out of the winter solstice celebration. What happened? In pagan times, in pagan places like the, the Egyptians did this, the Greeks did this, the Romans did this, they believed that in the winter when the days got shorter, they thought it represented that the sun, who they worshipped as a god, was getting weaker and sicker. And every year, now, now friends, we shouldn't laugh at our, our ancestors, but it's a little funny, because every year they went through the heartache, what if the sun never comes out again? So, at the, at, at, at the point of the solstice, that is, that is when the sun is at the lowest point in the sky, or in other words, the days of the shortest, they would have this celebration. And depending on the, who you read, there are different ideas about this. But some people believe that they were trying to remind the sun god how to be alive. And so they would bring evergreen plants into the house and make it part of the celebration in their mind to show the sun, see, remember, you make things green, remember? Come back. And guess what? It worked. <laughs> no, you're laughing, it did. Every, see, see this, is how, this is how superstition happens. My grandma taught me this every year. We bring in the green, and this, you might laugh at it with your degree, but every year the sun comes back, so who can say? And so what happened was, when the gospel was spreading among these pagan tribes, they accepted Jesus, but they brought a little bit of their culture with them. And don't judge them, because we all do the same. And so they said, well... This isn't celebrating the rebirth of the sun god, because obviously we don't believe in that anymore. This is celebrating the rebirth of the son of God. Yeah! And he died in the tree, so it's a tree. Yeah, whatever. And, and this, listen, guys, this, this is what happened. This is what happened. Do you, do you remember the man called Martin Luther? Isn't he a hero for us who are Protestant? Do you know, I didn't know this until I found this out this week, do you know he was the one who introduced lights on the, on the, on the evergreen tree? Martin, no, no. One day he was out walking, so the story goes, he was working on the sermon in his mind and it was dark and he saw the stars twinkling and the beautiful evergreen trees and he thought, wouldn't that be wonderful if my family could enjoy it? So he cut down an evergreen tree, put it into his house and attached some candles to it. And from that Protestant German tradition is where the tradition of having a lighted Christmas tree comes from. That's where it comes from. That's where it comes from. So... What does the Bible say? Anytime you have a question, you should answer it with this question. What does the Bible say? All right. Acts chapter 15, verse 28 to 29. The question is, should, should Christians stay away from specifically pagan things? Acts chapter 15, 28 to 29. It says, for it seemed good to who? Stay with me. Guys, trust me. You can see my smile. There's good news. Trust me. Stay with me. It seemed good to who? The Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. These what kind of things? So he's saying, listen, let's cut, let's cut everything. Here are the only things that matter. Verse 29. That you abstain from what? No, what's the first thing? From things offered to who? Is, does that seem clear? Like he says, listen, here are the necessary things. I know there's all kinds of things going on, but here are the necessary things. Stay away from anything offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these things, you will do well. So based on the Bible, does the Bible teach that Christians should stay away from anything offered to idols? Yes or no? That's not hard, friends. Yes or no? All right. First Corinthians 8, 1 to 13. Now this is Paul writing. Paul who was at that meeting. Who is Paul? Is he just some guy? Who is he? 
Was, was he a prophet in the church in the first century? Yes. Did he have the Holy Spirit? Okay, so, so, so the first one said, the Holy Spirit said, as we quote the writings of Paul to the Corinthians, can we equally say the Holy Spirit said? Yes or no? Yes. Guys, you're, 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 you're making me scared. Is Acts more Holy Spirit filled than Corinthians? No, it's both the Holy Spirit, right? Okay. Now concerning things what? Offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. Amen. Verse 2, and if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. Friends, <laughs> some of you should have just said ouch right now. Paul is basically saying, if you're sitting there thinking with your smug self, oh yes, I know the truth on these things, you have demonstrated that you know nothing yet. Amen. Ouch. Ouch. Verse 3, but if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Verse 4, therefore concerning the eating of things, what? Offered to idols. Let me help you understand. Back in the first century, if you wanted to eat clean meat, what kind of meat? There was only one source to get that clean meat. And that was from the markets. But all the meat in the markets originally came from the temples. There was no meat industry as we have it today. The only meat that existed was meat that was first offered to the temple of Diana or Zeus or whoever, and then the priest would butcher it and sell it in the markets. So you could not, unless you had your own lamb, you could not eat clean meat that had not been offered to idols. Do you understand the issue? Are you getting it? So if you wanted to eat a nice piece of lamb, that wasn't offered to an idol, you had an issue back in that day. Are you with me? Unless you lived in Jerusalem. Now, if you lived in Jerusalem, that was an issue. But if you lived anywhere else, Paul says, concerning things offered to idols, we know, what do we know? That an idol is what? Please stay awake here. Holy Spirit, help them to stay awake in this moment. An idol is what? Okay, some of you just missed the good news. <laughs> An idol is what? Nothing. Idols are not true. You can offer the lamb to the idol all you want. But there is nothing behind the idol. Because the idol is not true. It's going to take a moment to settle in. And there is no other God but one. Here is what Paul is saying. Friends, I understand the conflict in your heart about engaging in things like, for example, this food that was specifically offered to an idol. But please be encouraged because idols don't exist. There is no sun god. There is no moon god. There is no Thor. There is no Woden. There is no Ra. There is no Zeus. There is only Jesus. All the other gods are a lie. Was there anything poisonous? in the fruit, in the Garden of Eden? Was it true that if you ate the fruit, you would get, have this amazing experience? It was a lie. Eve did not, did not lose out because she did something that was true. She lost out because she disobeyed what God said. There was nothing behind it. Friends, don't be afraid of plants. No, really, guys. Don't be afraid of trees and bushes and shrubs. If you have accepted Jesus, and if you are filled with the power of the kingdom to come, how can you be afraid of baubles? Why are you freaking out over mistletoe? You should be walking on water and 
raising the dead by now. Read the New Testament. Why are we worried about these trivial things? If God is for us, who could be? Listen, I don't care what secret society in what secret enclave made what plan to deceive the world. Guess what? There is no power behind them. I don't care if they put their stickers on cars. I don't care if they're in the music industry. I don't care if they're on coffee cups. There is no power behind them. For us, there is only one God. He goes, he goes on. He goes on. For even if there are so-called gods, he said, listen, okay, fine, there are no gods. But for the sake of argument, let's say that there were some other gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, verse 6, yet for us, there is one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we live. So Paul is saying, go ahead and eat the meat offered to the idol nothing behind it. So then what's the issue? Why in, why in Acts did they say don't do it? Oh, now you're thinking, verse 7. However, what's that word? There is not in everyone that knowledge. Friends, not everyone knows this. Some people really think there is a sun god. Right? Right? Don't judge them. Don't hate. Not everyone knows this. For some, with consciousness, until now, eating it as a thing offered to an idol and their conscience being weak is the words. What Paul is saying is, there are some people who have come into the faith, who came from a pagan background, and all their life, when they ate this piece of lamb for them, it was connected to the idol. And even though they now understand and accept Jesus, there is part of their conscience that is troubled when they eat the lamb. So you know what Paul is saying? Even though it's not a thing, if it's a thing for you, don't do it. Do you catch that? <laughs> If it's, if it's a problem to your conscience, don't do it. But just know, this is not actually a thing. Verse 8, but food does not commend us to God. For neither if we eat are we the better, nor if we do not eat are we the worse. Friends, it is never right to violate your conscience. You know what someone wants me to do right now? Someone wants me to say... <clears throat> Pastor, just, just tell us what it is so we can all do it. No, 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 friends. I can't do that. You have to wrestle with the Bible in the spirit yourself. It is never right for you to go against something that you are convicted not to do. Never safe. I don't care if everybody else is doing it. If in your spirit it's not right, don't do it. But guess what? It is also not right to violate the conscience of others. It is not okay for me to try to make you feel guilty about something that I'm feeling guilty about. Nor should I try to make you feel okay with something I'm okay about. Don't violate my conscience. I won't violate yours. But beware lest this liberty of yours, this what? <clears throat> He's talking to liberals now. Be careful lest this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak. There is a danger that for some of us who have been delivered, we feel like now we can go around and just live however we want and who cares who's offended? No, 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 friends. If my liberty is a stumbling block to someone else, that's a problem. For verse 10, if anyone sees you who have knowledge, that means those who know that the idol is not a real thing, if they see you eating in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? Well, look, pastor's doing it. So I don't think it's wrong, but I don't think it's right, but if pastor's doing it, then I guess we should do it too. And because of your knowledge, shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? But when you thus sin against your brethren, where is the sin, friends? 
Is the sin in eating or not eating the thing offered to idols? Where is the sin? In sinning against your brother and sister. Your actions have implications for those around you. When you wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat again. I want three vegetarians to say amen on that one. <laughs> Paul says, listen, now friends, this is back in the day. There was no Worthingtons, there was no, there was no Boca Burger. You don't eat meat, you just have vegetables. He's saying, listen, I'm so committed to not being an offense to someone else, if I never get to enjoy meat again, so be it. I'm not going to be a stumbling block for someone, for my brother or sister. All right. What about Christmas trees? We're going to be done here. I know we're going late, but we're going to be done here. So, for some of you, and I mean this respectfully, but it's also humorous, for some of you, and some of us, let me put myself in that boat, who have been Adventist a minute, the Bible is good. We believe the Bible. But if we could get some Ellen White, that would really help. I, I, know, I know who you are. It's okay, I love you. I'm the same way. So here's what Ellen White said. Okay? She's not Pastor Jonathan, so in case you want to write to the conference, you have to include her. All right. <clears throat> She says, let not the parents take the position. This is an Adventist home. What kind of home? So, so you're trying to make a real Adventist home. This is what, okay. Let not the parents take the position that an evergreen, translation Christmas tree, placed in the church for the amusement of the Sabbath school scholars, translated children, is a sin. I thought there'd be at least one Amen. If you've been looking for it, you found your quote. It's not a sin. Oh. Someone's just text someone Christmas is back on. It may be made a great blessing. She says in another place, God would be well pleased. God would be who? What? So how many of you would like to please the Lord? How many of you are Adventists primarily because you want to please Jesus? Whatever pleases Jesus, that's what I do. If he says keep the Sabbath to please him, I keep the Sabbath. Okay, fine. I'm glad you said amen. God would be well pleased if on Christmas, each church would have a Christmas tree. Sorry, I'm just, maybe I missed. Maybe these are some of the apocryphal verses that, what? God would be pleased. How? God would be pleased if every church... Now, this is the problem. She didn't say some churches, you know, the liberal churches on the south coast. No, no, no. She said, on the west coast. She said every church would have a Christmas tree, watch this, on which shall be hung offerings, great and small, for these houses of worship. She's saying we could use the Christmas tree to raise money for the church at the academy. Amen. Just... I'm just trying to follow Ellen White. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to, that's what I'm trying to do. All right. So you, as you can imagine, she says stuff like that, and they wrote letters, because even back in the day, they wrote letters to the conference. So she says, letters of inquiry have come to us asking, shall we have a Christmas tree? Will it not be like the world? We answer, you can make it like the world, if you have a disposition to do so. Or you can make it as unlike the world as possible. Friends, is the issue the tree? The issue is this up here. The issue is my mind. The issue is my intention. The issue is my motive. Now, be careful because there are a few of us right now who are like, well, this is just license. This year we're going all out. No, 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 no. Don't misunderstand what she's saying. This season is not supposed to be a season of just blessing for me. Amen. That's not what it's about. But, but I can use the season to enjoy with my family, yes, and my kids, yes, but also to bless others. Amen. Can I put a plug here right now for Amen. paying tithe before Christmas shopping? Okay, just... You know, it's, Amen. Let's move on. All right. Th there is no, listen, she's got this. There is no particular sin in selecting a fragrant evergreen tree. So you can even use a fresh one. Well, as long as it's not it's plastic, somehow that's better. No, no, no. You, if you want to use the real one, fine. Placing a fragrant evergreen and placing it in our church. But the sin lies where? 
in the motive which prompts to action and the use which is made of the gifts placed under the tree. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Some of us are saying, well, we're really being holy by not having the tree, but we forget that she said the sin is in the gifts, what you're using them for. Amen. Oh, now, now, now no one wants to say amen with me no more. If I'm, if I'm spending money for myself to just gratify myself, and I don't have a tree, am I better now? Come on, friends. She's saying think from cause to effect. Okay, here's the last one. Every tree in Satan's garden, every tree where? Hangs laden with the fruits of vanity, pride, self-importance, evil desires, and extravagance. All poisoned fruit. But very gratifying to the carnal heart. Let the churches present to God Christmas trees in every church and let them hang thereon the fruits of what? Beneficence and gratitude Offerings coming from a willing heart and hands. Fruits that God will accept as an expression of our faith and our great love to him for the gift of his son, Jesus Christ. Did you know, if you do it right, your Christmas tree could be an offering of faith acceptable to God? Amen. Friends, if they can take a tree and offer it to a fake God who doesn't read, he isn't real, can we not take our entire lives, including every tree, every morsel of bread, every cup of water, and offer it to the true and living God? Let the evergreen be laden with fruit, rich and pure, wholly acceptable to God. And she ends with the rhetorical question. Here's where we're going to end the sermon. Shall we not have such a Christmas as heaven can approve? See, the issue is not, you okay? The issue is not Christmas or no Christmas. The issue is not tree or no tree. The issue is not whatever or not whatever. The issue is, can we do it to honor God? Now, let's just be honest. Not all of us can. Not all of us can. Let's just be very honest. For some of us, that thing is so deep. Everything Okay. Some of us, that thing is so deep that we can never really feel worshipful for God with a tree. And if that's your case, don't feel embarrassed. Don't be ashamed. That's fine. I'm not telling you you have to go get one. But for others, it's not a problem. And maybe in a house of worship where we all come together, we have to have a conversation about how can we best honor God and not put anyone out, or make anyone feel uncomfortable. But in the privacy of your own home, can, shall we not have such a Christmas as heaven can approve? Do you know why Jesus chose to associate himself with pagans? Because he came to save his people from their sins. That's why he came in that family tree. To show us that if he can save those pagans... If there's hope for them, there's hope for you. May this be a time of year where we have hope, where we have joy, and the whole world knows it's not because of Santa, it's not because of the presence under the tree, it's because of the gift of God in Jesus Christ. Amen. <coughs>
the pastor prays, and we all listen to the postlude and then dismiss. Thank you. And as we head to prayer, just reminded that Pathfinders, you have your meeting, and there is food for you to take for yourself in the community. We have the start of our week of prayer at 4 p.m. Father, we thank you so much <coughs> that you died on a tree to redeem our family tree. Lord, we have people in our family, including ourselves, who are so far from you. And at this time of the year, we choose to remember the wonderful gift of heaven to earth in Jesus Christ. We know that this holiday did not originate in scripture. But we also know that there is no God but our God. And we choose to worship you, not ourselves, not the commercial culture, not the whims of our family. We choose to give you the honor and the glory at this time of year. And we thank you for loving us so much that you died to save us from our sins. May we leave this place, but not your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.